and today we're going to hear about his latest work on uh, patterns of sunlight on exoplanets. So please join me in, in welcoming Tony. Hi there. Okay. Um, well, thanks for that introduction. And uh, well, uh, actually, I'm, I'm talking about a whole series of three papers uh, I did and uh, why I did those I should share with you. And that's because uh, I got tired of reading the same conventional wisdom all the time. And uh, that's, that's given here. Okay. Uh, it's often said, exoplanets, most of their stars, are unsuitable for life because they always keep the same side towards their suns. Uh, so their water and other volatiles freeze out on the dark sides. Well, this is uh, driven by an analogy with the Earth's moon that always keeps the same face towards us, of course. But in the case of extrasolar planets, it's misleading. And uh, we have a nice counterexample in our own solar system. Um, Mercury, which is our, the planet closest to our sun, is in what we call a three halves, three to two spin orbit resonance, which means, like it says here, it rotates three times during every two orbits. Uh, this situation is depicted here in a nice figure from a paper by Dermot. You see the reference? Uh, if you look at it in an inertial frame, like you're just watching from some distant point in space, uh, okay, Mercur Mercury is uh, this two toned football shaped object. Uh, at periapsis, when it's closest to the sun, its long axis points towards the sun. Okay, but then it's rotating one and a half times as fast as its orbital rate. So that means that by the time it's gone halfway around the sun, okay, it's rotated three quarters of the way around, and now its short axis is pointing towards the sun. And as it comes back around to perihelion again, it's rotated one and a half times, so now the opposite hemisphere is facing the sun from last time. And it goes around again, and then the original hemisphere comes back and faces the sun. So. Um, if you look at this uh, if, as if you were riding on the surface of Mercury, you would see the sun going around the planet in this complicated double loop where it tends to uh, hang around the long axis of Mercury close to the planet, and then it goes around this, this long arc uh, over the uh, far from the short axis, and then it comes back around the other end of the long axis and repeats this situation. Now it's going in the, in the opposite direction to the uh, orbital motion. OK, that keeps happening. OK, so why do we care about this? Well, as you can imagine, this kind of a, uh, a motion leads to very complicated temporal cycles of insulation. By insulation, I mean the heating from the sun and illumination as well. Uh, and this has significant implications, uh, not least for the detection of infrared emissions from extrasolar planets that might be doing something similar, and also the interpretation of their emissions. And of course, this kind of uh, pattern of insulation has uh, profound effects on a planet's climate and naturally uh, its habitability as well. OK, so um, now this kind of thing uh, can happen if a planet is in an eccentric orbit as Mercury is, for example. So we have to take a little closer look at eccentricity. So uh, as we know from Kepler's first law, uh, planets go around their stars in ellipses with the sun or a star at one focus, as depicted here. Here's the, uh, here's the star at the focus. And the eccentricity is a measure of how far the focus is from the center of the orbit. Um, and uh, it's measured in units of the center major axis, which is just half the long, longest diameter of the orbit. And there are other parameters, like the semi-minor axis, uh, the periapsis distance, which is the closest approach to the star. And there's another thing which is called the semi-lattice rectum, or sometimes just the parameter p. And it's defined that way. Uh, not to be confused with big P, the orbital period. Uh, now, it's interesting to notice, as, as you probably know, the orbital period is a function only of the planet's semi-major axis uh, and also it's the mass of the star times the gravitational constant. 
Uh, similarly, the energy of the orbit depends only on that same major axis. But there's the angular momentum per unit mass, which I'm calling little h down here, which depends both on the same major axis and the eccentricity of the orbit. Uh, this is going to be interesting later, but um, notice for now that this angular momentum is proportional to the square root of this semilattice rectum. OK. Um, so let's just look at the actual eccentricities of some extrastellar planets. Here I've plotted uh, six, the 627 extrasolar planets uh, now known with, with uh, known semi-major axes and uh, detectable eccentricities. There are more uh, that are nominally have zero eccentricity, but uh, those are generally not well determined. And you can see these eccentricities very, uh, range very widely from practically zero down here all the way up to nearly unity which would be a, uh, the limit for a bound orbit. Uh, while the center major axis is going down from less than 1 one hundredth of an AU up to more than 100 AU, where, of course, the uh, 1 AU is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Um, but notice also that the uh, eccentricity is correlated with the center major axis. There is this, uh, let's go back here gotten ahead of myself. OK, there's a, a roll-off uh, where the orbital eccentricity, come back, is lower uh, for the smaller semi major axes. OK, and that's universally <coughs> attributed to, let's go back, come on. Uh, this keeps advancing. Can we stop that somehow? Keep clicking? Yeah, OK. Uh, yeah, all right. So this, this uh, roll-off is attributed to <coughs> dissipation in the planet of tides raised by the star. So the star raises tides in the planet, and the energy is dissipated by tidal friction. Now, that, uh, be, as we know, since the orbital energy is dependent on, on the semi-major axis, that causes the semi-major axis to decay. It also causes the eccentricity to decay, because uh, if you although the orbital energy is decreasing, tides do not change the angular momentum of the planet. So as A is decreasing, 1 minus E squared has to increase to compensate, so E itself has to decrease. Uh, that's why both E and A decay together. But also notice that since the angular momentum doesn't change, the semilattice semi rectum doesn't change either. So if we go back and we change this plot, now watch the points up near the top from E versus A to eccentricity versus semilattice rectum. These points shift over to the left. And now, whereas formerly planets uh, under the influence of tidal uh, dissipation would travel down this plot kind of diagonally, on this kind of a plot, they move straight down because the semilattice rectum is conserved. OK, so uh, when I originally did this back in 07, um, I had only one third as many planets, but um, the pattern was the same. It hasn't changed. OK, so um, well, in addition to decreasing E and A, tides in the planet also tend to reduce its rotation rate and its obliquity. Um, uh, what do I mean by obliquity? Uh, here I'm defining it as the angle between a planet's spin and orbital angular momenta, as defined by the right-hand rule. There's a nice little figure for you. Um, uh, sometimes it's defined as the angle between a planet's equator plane and the or orbital plane, but this is more convenient because it uh, helps uh, to define a retrograde rotation that's more than 97 degrees, which is not uh, all that uncommon. Okay, so. Tides decay of planet's rotation rate as well as its obliquity, but not necessarily uh, all uh, down to synchronous rotation or down to zero obliquity. Uh, there are many ways in which it can hang up, uh, especially if a planet's orbit is eccentric. Uh, and the details of that process depend on 
the model you use for tidal dissipation. Um, here are a couple of models. Uh, there are two main ones. The less common I've plotted here as a solid line. <coughs> uh, it's called a constant Q model because uh, except for a sign change when it crosses to zero, the drag on the planet, the rate at which the rotation rate decreases, is pretty much independent of the frequency uh, of the tides, which is related to the rotation rate. It's the speed at which the bulge due to tides moves across the planet. Um, this is uh, appropriate for uh, solid body friction. An analog would be if you were pushing a, a, a book across a desk, the uh, resistance tends to be independent of the speed at which you're pushing it. Uh, now, on the contrary, the more common model is called the viscous model, or the laminar viscous model. I've drawn it here as this kind of diagonal dashed line. Uh, and this is appropriate more for like a lubricated kind of friction. Uh, you could also imagine, uh, what's nice about this model is that it's analytically convenient. For example, for most tidal models, you have to uh, Fourier analyze all the different components and frequencies that occur in the problem. And for the uh, viscous model, uh, you don't. It's, it's analytically much simpler. But that doesn't mean that it's, it's realistic. In fact, uh, you could imagine a, uh, a turbulent analog where the drag force is proportional to the square of the frequency, uh, as happens, for example, with eddy viscosity in a fluid. But uh, a more realistic model may be this dot hello there we go. this dot dash curve um, which is a maxwell or viscoelastic model this applies to a substance like uh, a tar or silly putty or a lot of other things uh, for short time uh, periods they behave elastically but over a long time scale they they flow like a liquid uh, well, which of these is actually right? Uh, well, there's recent work that shows that geologic materials tend to behave like something in between the, uh, the solid and the dot dash curves. Their, their tidal response is pretty flat as a function of frequency. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, a great deal which tidal model you use, except that the uh, constant Q and other models that are close to it and fairly realistic tend to lead to enhanced probabilities of uh, winding up in a spin orbit resonance. OK, uh, like the synchronous resonance, for example, is one of them. Um, but the, there are other resonances that occur for when uh, the orbit is eccentric. Uh, let's look at the uh, case where the eccentricity is 0. Here's a, a planet which is not in any kind of a resonance. So it's just spinning independently of its orbital motion. And it's also got zero eccentricity or, or obliquity. So I've drawn this kind of map of the insulation as across the planet as a, where we go, as a function of um, latitude and longitude. Okay, And I've shown the, um, the maximum insulation across the surface and its mean over time. Okay, The maximum insulation peaks at the equator, as you can see here, uh, at, as, and its peak value is just the what I call the extrasolar constant, analogous to the solar constant on Earth. It's the, planet's, it's the star's luminosity uh, divided by 4 times 4 pi times the square of a center major axis. Okay, and you can, you can define that in any kind of wavelength regime you're interested in. But uh, OK, so I've drawn, in addition to these contours that are plotted down at the bottom, uh, I've drawn a, 90, a contour at 99.99% of the maximum. So that you can see it's along the equator there is where the peak insulation occurs. And then it drops <coughs> off as the cosine of the latitude to zero at the poles. And the mean insulation uh, behaves similarly, except you divide the maximum insulation by pi to get the mean. OK, that's if the planet is not resonant. But now let's look at the synchronous resonance for comparison. Now here I've plotted 
the same kind of thing, except the maximum insulation and the mean insulation and the minimum insulation are all the same because it never changes. Uh, here's a planet that's <coughs> always facing onto its sun, and uh, the, s the sun is hovering right over the subsolar point there, never moving, and this entire hemisphere is illuminated, and the illumination drops off as the cosine of the latitude and the distance from the solar point until you get to the, the terminator. And then the whole far side of the uh, planet is dark. And that's what, I, that's what the, the, the blue contours are for. There's no insulation there at all. Now, uh, OK. Again, that's a synchronous resonance. But if you look at the 3 to 2 resonance, as Mercury is in, OK, we'll see how that behaves as a function of eccentricity. OK, uh, now this is from Brown et al. And they used a, uh, to plot it up, a slightly different color scheme than I did. But there are color bars here to help you figure it out. OK, um, now for zero eccentricity, the uh, insulation pattern, and this is the, uh, the mean insulation, is pretty much the same as if the planet were not in resonance at all. But for an eccentricity of uh, 20%, 0.20, like up here, uh, as, as Mercury has, you can see that there are two hot spots on the equator where uh, the planet's long axis is. And it's uh, cooler in between with a short axis. And it falls down to zero at the poles. As you raise the eccentricity of the orbit, that pattern pretty much persists until you get up to uh, a regime change here at about an eccentricity of 70%, where it starts to look again like the non-resonant case. But when you go past that to an 80% eccentricity, this, the uh, insulation <coughs> flips around so that now the short axes are hot and the long axes are cooler. But still, the insulation vanishes at the poles. OK, well, again. This is uh, as a function of eccentricity, but there's still no obliquity in the problem. So let's consider what is the effect of a planet's obliquity. Um, OK. Again, here's uh, to remind you about what the obliquity is. And the obliquity in the solar system varies a lot uh, among the different planets. For extrasolar planets, it's essentially unknown. So it uh, could be practically anything uh, as far as we know. <coughs> So, um, but the effect of ob obliquity on uh, the insulation can be very significant. For example, here's again a non-resonant planet. It's on a circular orbit. This plot is again from somebody else, Lunds and Meyer et al., and they have a different color scheme. But this uh, shows the situation. <laughs> For a zero obliquity, the insulation as a function of latitude, come, come back peaks at the equator and drops off to zero at the poles. Now, as you increase the obliquity, uh, the situation becomes less extreme. The poles get a little more sunlight until when you reach a point around 50 degrees obliquity, um, the insulation, the mean insulation, is almost independent of latitude. As you go on farther to high obliquities around 80 or 90 degrees, the poles actually get more sunshine than the equator does. And so they become uh, presumably warmer, and uh, the equator becomes cooler. OK, um, now that's a non-resonant planet. Something similar happens uh, if you have a planet in one of these spin orbit resonances. For example, uh, if you're in the synchronous resonance, the sun moves up and down across the equator, but it stays on the same side of the planet. Uh, this shows that situation for a case of a 45 degree obliquity. But uh, this is a synchronously rotating planet, no eccentricity. And so uh, the sun tracks this kind of a, a loop, figure 8, that uh, looks like the analemma that you find on many terrestrial globes. This figure is uh, actually the same as the intersection of the surface of the planets uh, treated as a sphere with a right circular cylinder uh, that's tangent from the inside. And uh, so we're going to see this subsolar track again in, uh, 
in a moment. Okay, so uh, how does this motion of the subsolar point affect the insulation over the surface of the planet? Well, here's a case for a synchronously rotating planet. Again, there's no eccentricity, but I've given this an eccentricity, uh, an obliquity of 30 degrees. So if you look at the maximum insulation up in the top panel here, uh, you can see that that 99.99% insulation contour is making a figure eight loop that's just tracking that analemma, the subsolar ground track. There's also, and you can see that the insulation is very high on one side of the planet, but it vanishes on the far side. Uh, the same goes pretty much for the mean insulation. But if you look at the minimum insulation down here in the bottom panel, you see that it vanishes in all that blue over most of the planet, except that there's a region near the, the mean subsolar point, the front of the planet, which is in permanent daylight. Okay, and the same applies if we change the obliquity. If we go to 60 degrees, that region of permanent daylight shrinks, and likewise the regions of permanent nighttime shrink as this uh, figure eight track of the subsolar point broadens in latitude and longitude too. Okay. Now if we, if we push on to an obliquity of 90 degrees, okay, what's going to happen is first of all, the minimum insulation va uh, vanishes, so I don't even plot it, it would be all blue. Uh, the, the maximum insulation is shown by this top panel and you can see that the track of the subsolar point now goes right over the pole making this sort of X contour here of 99.99% uh, solar constant insulation. And uh, now th there is no point on this planet where the insulation vanishes entirely. Uh, there are some uh, areas that have pretty low insulation, but um, it never goes to zero. And so that means that the, the climate is going to be a lot uh, milder than uh, on in the previous case. Uh, also notice that the mean insulation here at the uh, near the subsolar point has now split into two peaks instead of one. Pressing on to 115 degrees, we go retrograde now just to see what happens. Uh, now the subsolar uh, ground track wraps around the planet and uh, the peak of the mean insulation has now split into three parts, three peaks at the, at the center here. And keeping this up, if we go to 140 degrees, that uh, peak insulation uh, in the mean has reunited into a single uh, peak, but notice that the minimum has now split into uh, six minima across the planet. Um, okay, if we kept going to 180 degrees, it would look like it wasn't resonant at all. Okay. Um, <coughs> All right, so far that is what happens if you have an eccentricity only or an obliquity only. Um, because notice these have zero eccentricity. But what happens if you have both eccentricity and obliquity at the same time, which is uh, presumably the general case? Um, well, it gets a little more complicated, as you might imagine. And so uh, we're going to need to define a new angle. Actually, I'll define a few here. Uh, this situation is best visualized instead of having the planet, instead of as the planet going around the star, have the star go around the planet. Imagine you're riding on the planet, and this is the celestial sphere uh, as seen uh, from the planet, uh, centered on the planet, but it's not rotating. Okay, the planet is rotating around in this system, but this sphere is centered on the planet, and so this uh, horizontal oval here represents the equator plane of the planet. The tilted oval represents, in this frame, the orbit of the sun going around the planet. Okay, and uh, yeah. okay, so the sun is going to be at some location given by some latitude and longitude, which I've drawn here, and the, so the, the sun is going to be here at any moment, and its location is defined by a couple of angles: the true anomaly, which is how far it is past its perihelion, periapsis. And this angle alpha, which is going to be significant, it's the, uh, can, in this view, it's the sun's longitude of periapsis. But if we went back to the uh, 
solar-centered view, it would be the planet's longitude of vernal equinox. That's the thing that processes with the precession of equinox. Uh, I'm going to define just a couple more quantities here. Uh, little omega is the planet's rotation rate, and n is its orbital mean motion. That's just 2 pi over the orbital period. OK. Um, so we're going to need these to understand spin orbit resonances. There, uh, it's convenient to divide them into two classes. Uh, and the first is the integer spin orbit resonances. And by that, that I mean that this ratio of the planet's rotation rate to its mean motion is a whole number, like 0, plus or minus 1, uh, 2, 3, et cetera. Uh, now, the, the 0 and the negative resonances are not very important, so I'm going to concentrate on the positive ones here. Uh, and so all these resonances have certain characteristics which uh, we're not going to bother to go into in detail. It's better just to look at some, uh, some more maps. So <coughs> doing that, first let's look at the synchronous state where you have both eccentricity and obliquity happening at the same time. Now from here on in, because I have to vary alpha, and three parameters is, is too many, I'm going to stick with an eccentricity of 0.2 and an obliquity of 60 degrees. Okay. So here now that precession angle, alpha, is set to 0. And you can see that uh, now these, uh, these looping curves are, again, the track of the subsolar point. And the contours are as before. The colorful contours show the insulation. You can see that now this analemma type figure 8 is tilted, and so are all the other features uh, of the insulation. This um, region of permanent daytime and the region of permanent nighttime, etc. Uh, but the uh, insulation, both the maximum and the mean, both peak near the uh, near the center of, of this uh, illuminated face. As we change the parameter, the, the angle alpha, as it's going to process. Um, here we get, as it's the case for 45 degrees, you notice that the configuration has changed, the shape of that uh, subsolar ground track has changed, and the contours have changed too. Uh, if we push on to a 90 degree alpha, uh, we have yet a different figure. Uh, Pardon me, can you remind me what alpha is? Alpha is uh, probably best regarded as the uh, longitude of periapsis of the sun. Okay, uh, we'll take another look at that. It's how far, it's how far, uh, how far perihelion. It's it's pretty much how far the uh, perihelion is from the equator. Okay. Um, or along its orbit track. That's right. That's right. Not its latitude, but its distance along the track. From where, from where the node is, where it crosses. Uh, it, yeah, the uh, longitude of vernal equinox is another way to look at it. OK, but uh, the important thing is that it varies. It, it circulates through 360 degrees over a moderate time scale. OK, all right. Um, now, so I've gone from 0 to 90 degrees. If I were to go past 90 degrees, another 45 degrees to 135, the figure that I would get would just be like the mirror image of that one. If I went to 180, it would be the mirror image of this one for 0, and so on. So basically, these couple of figures cover the whole range of the space, pretty much with various reflection symmetries and so on. OK, that's a synchronously rotating case. <coughs> By the way, I want to point out that these extra colors that you're seeing in the top panel, the, the purples and the greens and so on, are because of the planet's eccentricity causes the insulation to exceed the solar constant, or the extra solar constant at those locations. So I, I needed some extra colors for that. OK, now here is uh, the situation where the, uh, we're in a 2 to 1 resonance now. The planet is rotating twice as fast as its orbital mean motion. And again, that means that uh, the entire planet gets illuminated from time to time, so there's no the minimum uh, insulation everywhere is zero. Every place experiences day and night. So I haven't bothered to plot that. Just the maximum and the minimum and the mean insulation. 
Now here's the track of the subsolar point. As you can see, it's uh, traversing the entire planet from east to west, as a matter of fact. Uh, and the uh, contours of illumination uh, follow along accordingly. As we step through uh, the procession, processional angle, uh, you can see how that subsolar track and the corresponding contours evolve through 90 degrees, etc. Uh, so there are these really fairly interesting peculiar patterns you get. Uh, the contours are pretty angular and not at all rounded and smooth as you might expect. Okay, um, now the uh, same thing goes for the 3 to 1 resonance. We're still on the integer type resonances. Now the subsolar ground track wraps around the planet twice per insulation cycle. And uh, that changes with alpha as well. And uh, just one more here. For if we go up to a 4 to 1 resonance, now the ground track is wrapping around three times. And the insulation is changing accordingly. But as we go to higher and higher resonances, the contrast in these plots is decreasing. As we go went, went to very high order resonances, uh, numbers of, say, omega over n is 10, 20, or higher, uh, these plots look almost as if the planet were not resonant at all. They become independent of longitude and depend only on latitude. OK, um, so that's the general behavior of these integer resonances. But uh, there's another class, uh, which are called the half-odd integer spin resonances. That's a mouthful, but uh, the reason is that now this ratio of rotation rate to orbital motion is half of an odd integer. So it's plus or minus a half, three halves, five halves, etc. And this has its own characteristics. But the important one for our purposes here is that now the subsolar ground track and the insulation pattern that goes with it repeat twice around the planet. I'll show you what I mean. Here's a case for the uh, one half resonance. So this is, the planet is actually rotating slower than synchronous in this case, but it's a valid resonance. Um, now the subsolar ground track is going from west to east, but it's still bobbing up and down over the equator. Notice now, though, that it's, everything is happening twice. So the, if you will, the eastern and western hemispheres of the planet uh, look alike. Okay, and as we evolve through uh, the precessional angle alpha, uh, that remains the case, etc. All right, now let's go back to the resonance that we know uh, well, uh, the three halves resonance, like Mercury is in. Of course, Mercury has practically no obliquity. This is a case where if what would what it would be like if it had a 60 degree obliquity. Now uh, the ground track is going around from east to west again, and the pattern of insulation is repeating twice, uh, just like the ground track. And um, we'll step through this one, 45 degrees. Now the loops are changing, and you're getting some cusps down in the southern hemisphere, etc. And you get these uh, really, I think, kind of bizarre patterns. If we go up to a higher resonance still, this is the 5 halves resonance. Now the subsolar track is going around. It's still east to west, but now it goes around three times uh, wrapping around the planet. And uh, again, the uh, peak insulation is repeating twice around. So is the mean insulation. And you can see how that evolves with alpha as I step through this. OK, so this goes to show that you can get some uh, interesting patterns of insulation varying across the planet. But there's one more surprise in this, and that's the following. If you notice this plot down here, the mean insulation uh, looks to be symmetrical across the equator. The northern hemisphere is like the mirror image of the southern hemisphere. And if we go back, uh, OK, let's stay here. Uh, notice that, that that is not the case. That is not the case for the maximum insulation. And it certainly isn't the case for the subsolar ground track. If we go back and, t and check, it's still true 
uh, as we change alpha, and it's still true for this 3 halves resonance, the northern and southern hemispheres look the same for the mean insulation, uh, and so forth. In fact, this remains true for every half odd integer resonance that I've looked at. Um, well, okay, how about how about those uh, integer resonances? Well, we'll just run th back through them very quickly. Well, no, it's not happening here. Notice that the uh, northern and southern hemispheres are different in uh, all these plots. As we go through, it remains true. In fact, uh, for all of the integer resonances, it's not true. So we have this uh, interesting phenomenon that for the half-odd integer resonances, the mean insulation is symmetrical between the northern and southern hemispheres. Okay, well, why is that? Well, um, I have a uh, convincing explanation for it, but it's kind of unsatisfactory because, it, again, it involves a lot of Fourier analysis. And I'm hoping that uh, I or maybe somebody in this audience can do better than that and come up with a nice, simple, uh, clear uh, explanation for why that's happening. Meanwhile, we can draw some lessons from all this. Okay, so we know that uh, extrasolar planets could be in a wide variety of spin states. Okay, we don't, we don't know, but the dynamics indicate that there are a lot of possibilities. Uh, also, I've shown you that these unconventional rotations cause pretty complicated patterns of insulation across the surface of a planet. Uh, as a general rule, these unusual insulation patterns produce a milder climate because the insulation is more broadly distributed and you might expect that to improve planet's habitability as well. And uh, last but I guess not least, uh, that kind of the, the uh, unusual insulation patterns affect the detec detectability of exoplanets in the infrared and the interpretation of such observations as well. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at that uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions at this point. Uh, Tony, I was wondering if um, from your uh, from your patterns of insula insulation here whether it's possible to infer the spin states of the exoplanets uh, that we might see in the future. What sort of possibilities? Oh yeah, uh, are that, that speaks to this interpretation issue because uh, if uh, a planet is uh, detected, for example, by its infrared light curve, okay, uh, or, or let's say that the, uh, a planet may be, may be known, but its uh, light curve is, is measured, the uh, pattern of variation may not be what you expected, but it may indicate that the planet is not in some simple synchronous rotation, but in one of these more unusual spin states. Um, on a billion-year time scale, you would expect the orbital eccentricity to damp out to zero, um, especially in the case of planets orbiting close to a red star. Uh, why do we see so much eccentricity in the data that's been collected so far? And why do you think Mercury still has non-zero eccentricity? Okay. Uh, well. We do see uh, evidence, as I showed you uh, near the start, that a lot of planets have lost eccentricity. But it, the fact is that because there's so much more angular momentum in a planet's orbit than in its spin, in its rotation, that the uh, rotation state of a planet changes tidally much faster than its orbital eccentricity decays. So a planet can maintain orbital eccentricity for tens of billions of years in some cases. Uh, while its spin state has changed drastically. Uh, can your analysis help understand the Gregorian calendar and why we have <laughs> um, we have four years uh, of 365 days and then we have to add a day? Is this something to, that would fit into your analysis? I'm afraid I'd have to say not really because uh, 
the, uh, the Earth's rotation rate, which defines the length of a day, uh, is pretty independent of the length of the year. And uh, it's just coincidence that it happens to wind up at 365 and almost a quarter, but not quite. That's right. Yeah. Now, if we were on if we were on Mercury, we'd have a very interesting calendar, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's not the case here. Yeah, a couple of simple ones. Um, I'm a little puzzled as to what it means to be in resonance if the obliquity is 180 degrees. What does a one-to-one -one resonance mean? Okay. And, and is that something that could actually you could get tidal evolution into a state like that? Uh, okay. Uh, you can formally examine what would happen to a planet whose rotation rate is equal to its orbital rate, and, you know, if the periods are the same for any obliquity. But there is no uh, dynamical benefit for a planet to be uh, in a synchronous rotation rate or any... Uh, um, there's no benefit for a planet to be synchronous with a 180 degree obliquity. Um, I take that back. Actually, there is, there is a mild interaction, but it's very weak compared to the usual synchronous resonance. So um, it's kind of, um, l let's, let's put it this way, it's an unlikely event to find a planet with a really high obliquity like a 170, 180 degrees, that's also resonant. And what obliquity is this getting captured in the resonance to begin to become very unlikely? Uh, I'm afraid I have to is confess that that is unknown. Is it known which, which evolves more quickly, the obliquity or the um, spin rate? Uh, they evolve on comparable time scales. Okay. The obliquity uh, maybe maybe half as fast as the rotation rate. So I'll continue about dynamics. Um, so something like Earth or Super Earth would probably have its shape dictated by rotation rate, uh, unlike Mercury, which preserves some kind of solid shape. And also, you know, the obliquity will be determined by the spin state through Cassini state and all that. So have you looked into the dynamical part of it? beyond geometry of what is more likely than other states? Uh, yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if that's the entire answer. My question is, your last lesson there, insulation pattern affects exoplanet detectability by infrared. I'm sure it does. How does it? Does it make it easier? Does it make it more difficult? Does it make it easier in some circumstances? Uh, uh, the latter, yes. It depends. Because sometimes... Uh, Give okay, some examples. I don't have an example for you right now. But there are some times where, where the admission is not where you would expect it, but it's someplace else. And so it depends on where, where and when you're looking. Okay. Hi. Uh, on the third point about improved habitability, mm -hmm. so if you had a planet that was in a habitable zone that was, say, almost entirely water covered, would a complex pattern of insulation distribute the heat more efficiently th so that the ocean maintained a more uniform temperature than, say, Earth? Yes, that's my conclusion. Uh, my question was also about uh, lesson number three. Um, is there any program to actually produce global climate models for such weird uh, insulation patterns? Uh, there was a first attempt, actually, that just uh, came out. Let me just see whether I can flip to it. Um, because, let's see here. Yes, this came from... Uh, a preprint uh, where uh, these <coughs> individuals attempted to study the uh, potential uh, ecological niches on a planet in the three to two spin orbit resonance. Okay, uh, I think there was another question or two. 
<laughs> yeah, I have another one. I, I assume if the planet had a moon, that would make things even more complex, as I believe it does with the Earth. Okay. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, Tony, I have a... Um, I, I, I get to... No, stop clapping! <laughs> I get to say when the clapping starts. <laughs> Not Sorry. Sorry, Tony. Here we have a special city, uh, city black mug um, for you to uh, cogitate uh, over with some black material in there as well and uh, while you're thinking about patterns, okay. patterns of sunshine on, uh, on exoplanets in the future. Please join me in thanking Tony for his great talk. Okay. Thanks a lot. Feel free to come up and ask questions uh, of him.